Wonderful. It looks like we have people here. So hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz, and I'm the event coordinator at the bookstore. I'm thrilled today to be collaborating once again with our friends at New York Review Books to welcome Ruman Alam, Catherine Davis. Um, Lauren Groff was supposed to be with us, but apparently there's been some sort of hiccup and she can't join us, and Ann Halbert for a panel discussion in celebration of the reissue of Gene Stafford's classic debut novel, Boston Adventure. While the pandemic has taken a toll on all of our lives, virtual events like the one that you're about to see have become bright spots in our days. And I wanna give a special thank you to all of our guests for joining us this evening, to NYRB for helping us put it all together, and to you at home for joining us. Um, now to some housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please do click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen um, to submit them. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's also a chat button through which I'll be uh, posting a link to buy tonight's book, very important. Uh, one caveat for tonight's event is that we are all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads, so please do bear with any technical issues that might arise. We'll try to resolve them as quickly as possible. And we scheduled a whole host of summer programming for you, so do head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I want to point out in particular is next Thursday, July 29th. We're thrilled to welcome Omar el for a discussion of his new novel, What Strange Paradise, in conversation with Lydia Kiesling. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. And finally, we've enabled Zoom's auto-transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, you can hit the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable that. And now a little about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Ruman Alam is the author of the novels Rich and Pretty, That Kind of Mother, and Leave the World Behind. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, The New Republic, The New York Review of Books, Book Forum, and elsewhere. Catherine Davis is the author of eight novels, including The Silk Road and Duplex, a memoir, Aurelia Aurelia, this is forthcoming this spring, I hope I got that right. She is the senior fiction writer on the faculty of the writing program at Washington University. And Anne Holbert is the literary editor of The Atlantic and author of three books, including The Interior Castle, The Art and Life of Jean Stafford. And so without any further ado, I'll hand it off to you, Ruman, who will be moderating our, our conversation this evening. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Noah, and thank you to Community Bookstore. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I think some folks from New York Review Books are in the audience and they can attest to this. I have been publicly haranguing New York Review Books to bring Boston Adventure back into print uh, for years now, actually. And so I'm thrilled that it exists. I don't have my copy with me for some reason. I'm uh, uh, Something's wrong with my brain right now, um, but I think it's absolutely beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I think it's absolutely beautiful. It's a joy to see, and I'm really excited to be able to talk about it with Catherine and Anne. Before we, I, I feel like I should give like a synopsis of the novel, but before I do that, um, I wanted to take advantage of the fact that we have Stafford's biographer with us to ask Anne if you could give us a portrait of who Jean Stafford was at the moment when she published Boston Venture, which was her debut novel. Um, so explain her to us the way that you might explain a debut novelist in the contemporary moment. Um, what, what would you think is most important to know about her at that moment? Well, in 1944, which is the year uh, Boston Adventure was published, I think Jean Stafford would have cut a profile of the extremely well-connected, very young, promising novelist. She was 29. She'd been married for four years to Robert Lowell, the scion of a sort of aristocratic Boston family who himself was about to publish his debut book of poems that same month. Um, both of them had been taken up as protégés of the agrarian writers in the South, had had lots of dealings with the new critics. Um, Stafford had just two years into the work on Boston Adventure had had a fellowship at Yaddo. Um, so very plugged in, riding high, but that was really only part of the story because if you think of the previous five years, Stafford had been terribly ill for a large portion of those years. She'd had ovarian cysts removed and been hospitalized. She had sort of unexplained fevers and respiratory diseases. And probably most dramatically, she'd been in a harrowing car accident the year before she was married to Lowell in which 
he was drunk, he, the car smashed into a wall and basically her skull, her jaw, her cheeks were crushed. And she spent more than a month in the hospital, had five surgeries on her face and kind of suffered the repercussions of that for years to come. Her time at Yaddo was really fraught. Somehow she got there and the literary world of really tapped all of her insecurities and she was deeply sort of sick and really almost had a sort of mini nervous breakdown while she was there. So you'd think, how did she produce this huge novel? Boston Adventure is very long. Yeah. Um, and uh, her literary trajectory at that point would have been just as rocky. She had produced in those previous five years, three different manuscripts. Her publishing contacts were there and waiting, but each of them had been rejected, um, which you can sort of, they were autobiographical and tortured, but she actually thrived in some way that is hard to understand on this really turmoil filled and struggle filled period. And I think it, it's a kind of key to who she was then, though the public world wouldn't have known it that this sort of embattled outsider sense of herself as someone who both mm -hmm. wanted to be part of the literary world and held herself apart from it as a kind of distinctive independent soul who wanted to be plugged in socially, but also felt she wasn't. And that I think maybe leads well to a quick background about her family because I think embattled outsider captures her sense of her own upbringing and family. She grew up in California and Colorado. She was the lonely last of four children, felt she was kind of left out among her siblings, was uprooted from what she described later as a kind of idyllic childhood in on a, a, a walnut ranch in California. When her father lost all of the family's money, they went to Colorado. And there they were really leading a pretty hard scrabble existence. Her mother opened up a, a boarding house. Her father became ever more eccentric. He tried to write sort of Western novels and had been a real source of admiration for Stafford. She thought of him as the artist and the family, but here he was failing miserably and the rest of the family was trying to keep him, <laughs> keep the family afloat. Um, and she was furious at him. And she was, as a kind of model of what the artistic writing life was like, it was a very fraught figure. And in 1944, she would have been thinking, I have had success, he never had success. Yeah. And her mother was another source of sort of enragement to her. She considered her a sort of slave to domesticity, the most boring, conventional-minded, anti-intellectual person. So she always said, I just wanted to flee as soon as possible. And maybe, and she did flee. And in a way you can think of the Boston Adventure debut as this remarkable proof that yes, she had escaped. It sold yeah. really well, really quickly, and yet, and I think this, I'm sure our discussion will go here, to read Boston Adventure is to know that this is a writer who doesn't believe in such escapes and yeah. that the past is never the past and that finding an Im imaginative outlet is a deeply fraught endeavor. I wanna, I wanna recap, or I wanna sort of explain what Boston Adventure is. As Anne mentioned, it's a huge, novel, I think it's 500 pages or so in this edition. Um, it is divided into two halves. One, uh, the protagonist is a girl named Sony Marburg. At the beginning of the book, she's a child. Um, her father is a cobbler. Her mother is an hysteric. They are Russian. She's a Russian immigrant. They're both Russian immigrants, I believe. Um, they have this extremely, and use the word hard scrabble to describe um, Stafford's later life, and that is a, an appropriate word to describe Sony's life. Um, Sony's mother works as a maid at a hotel in this small fishing village where they live. And it is there that Sony, as a young girl, forges 
not quite a relationship, but a fascination with a woman named um, Mrs. Pride, Miss Pride, Lucy Pride, who is a sort of Boston dowager who vacations there during the summer. The second half of the book sees Sony as a young woman, in fact, living in Boston in the beautiful home of Miss Pride as a kind of, I don't even know what you would call it. She's there as a sort of like secretary, uh, charity case. And so we see, and so it's funny, Anne, to hear you talk about the, 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 the there's a clear biographical resonance in the idea of escape from roots of which you're ashamed, an aspiration to belong to a certain class of people. Um, but what's strange about it to me and what was so strange to me on the reread when I was reading your biography in tandem with the novel is that Boston Adventure is, as the title suggests, so interested in New England and the sort of very particular class modes of life in New England, which is not native to Stafford. It is, and I think I would have assumed that in such an autobiographical novel it would be, but it, it's in fact the product of study and observation. Is that right? Is that fair to say, do you think? Yes, I, I think in fact, it's the product of a concerted effort to somehow find a way that was more distanced from her own actual story to tell her story in a sort mm. of symbolic uh, mode that drew for its particulars on a world that she had re been introduced to relatively recently through the Lowell's, but still had that kind of detachments that allowed her to kind of nail it and not feel sort of totally under its, in its grip, even as she's describing a character who is similarly sort of not of it, but wishes she yeah. were. And I think she also, having been under the tutelage of the agrarians, you know, she was reading a lot of Henry James, which um, they, he was a lodestar for them and yeah. she loved Henry James. And I think that if you think about Boston Adventure as a kind of reverse of a Henry James, story, you know, structured story. It's not the innocent American heiress goes to Europe mm, and right. discovers the worldly, you know, tradition bound world that America doesn't know. It's the little girl who lives across from Boston in this impoverished European, you know, hut who <laughs> comes to New England um, only to discover that, you know, far from innocent, uh, it is, you know, a world of decadent entrapment. And I think that really spoke to her and gave her a structure. And then we can talk about Proust, which I think was her other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Before we get into that, um, so, you know, we're talking about this paperback edition of Boston Adventure, but Catherine, you were the editor on the Library of America edition of Stafford's work. And Obviously, you know, being admitted into the Library of America suggests something about the writer's stature. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how the edition came to be and why you believe, if you, if indeed you do, that Jean Stafford belongs in that company. Um, well, it is um, a little bit of a mystery to me <laughs> how that decision um, got made. Um, I know um, from my dealings with Library of America that there is a sort of lengthy process during which they're vetting the writers um, who they are going to include. Um, I have no clear sense of why Jean Stafford appeared at this particular moment. Um, I don't think that there was, you know, it wasn't the anniversary of anything yeah. in particular. Um, and I, I don't even think that the sense that is now a little bit more um, prevalent that these, particularly the women writers from the mid century um, somewhat ignored um, are now being paid attention to with more seriousness. I don't think that was going on. I don't really know why it happened when it happened. Um, 
I would say that for as far as I'm concerned, I feel like um, I feel like Gene Stafford is a highly original writer in a way that is not acknowledged. And mm. I, I, um, so I'm so happy that there's, you know, that people will have the opportunity to read what she's written, but I think she's misunderstood. Um, I think there's a sense that she's this great realist writer. And in fact, there's something just profoundly strange about, um, I'll say the novels in particular, though yeah. some of the short stories as well partake of this quality where you feel like you are in the real world and, and she uses her language so um, impressively um, as a student of Proust, as a student of James, as a student of, you know, literature to create what feels like a very real world. And then she'll, she'll just turn something around and you think because she's made it so real, you feel like the strange thing that is happening is real as well. And that, mm. um, I think that's a very, uh, key aspect of Boston Adventure, rereading it, I was struck by how strange, um, how strange its ending is. Yes. And, and this peculiar apparition in the middle of it of a yes. red room. Yeah. <laughs> um, that is, it, it, I mean, it's, it's mysterious, yeah. never really explained why she has this, um, why Sony, the yeah. narrator, has this vision. Um, and because the work is so deeply realist in its workings, you mm -hmm. just sort of feel like this is really happening. Um, and I feel like this, yeah. is, this is original and we need to acknowledge this fact about this writer, which I don't, I just don't feel like she's gotten her due credit. I think um, you're, I yeah got published by the Library of America. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think you're right. I mean, yes, you're right that there's a sense that the the um, the accomplishment is in um, the realist detail, right? And Anne mentioned that James was a touchstone and there's a lot of um, anthropology in Boston Adventure, this observation of the way they, there's a, there's a sort of minor character um, to who who has a salon in her home and Sony accompanies Miss Pride to the salon and you see this sort of observation of these emigre cultured habits and she talks about the paintings and the clothes and the music they listen to and it's very observed and so it feel like this anthropological text but as Catherine said there is Sony's mother ends up quite unwell and Sony while she is negotiating her mother's um, hospitalization for a kind of mental distress, Sony begins to have this strange kind of fevered vision of her own, of herself inside of a, a place, inside of a room, and observes that room almost the same way that she observes the stately homes of the rich that she has gained access to in Boston, but it's not a real place. And it's extremely strange and it goes on for quite a while. And she returns to this motif a couple of times at, at the book's conclusion. And it is odd. It is odd. This is an odd book. It is an unusual book. And I'm glad that you said that, Catherine. And so, but Catherine, before we started talking, you mentioned that you, you felt that there was sort of like a pinnacle of achievement for Stafford artistically. And that was in her second novel, The Mountain Lion. Is that right? Is that fair? I, I, that is my favorite of the three novels. Um, and I feel like I think maybe because there are ways in which in the mountain lion, she's most specifically making use of her autobiographical material. Yeah. Um, the West um, yeah. uh, is uh, sort of like part of the subject of the book. And, um, and yet the, 
fundamental strangeness that appears in Boston Adventure is also a facet of the mountain lion. I, and I, I kind of don't even want to talk about the way in which it operates in the mountain lion because um, I don't want to give anything about the mountain lion <laughs> away. Um, but she does some really strange things with pronouns that, yeah. um, that uh, uh, she is so inventive in a way that um, that is unexpected at that particular time, I would say, from mm -hmm. the kind of writing that was being done by, you know, sort of everybody. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think one aspect of her artistic project, um, one thing that occurs in some of her best work is the way that Stafford writes about children, sometimes inhabiting the perspective of children, sometimes writing about the worlds of children. I have children, when I watch my children and how they negotiate the world, it occurs to me that it's like this weird surreal joke that they don't entirely, children don't entirely understand what's happening. They sort of understand what's happening. They have their own their own vision version of what's happening, their own version of reality. And Stafford's work seems to sit in there at times, including in Boston Adventure, um, the, the first half of which really is about Sony as a pretty young girl. I think she's 12 at the beginning of the book. I wonder if that was, I mean, I'm not sure that we take children seriously as a literary subject even today, but I wonder if that had something to do with how the book was received or how Stafford was thought about. But as Anne mentioned, and maybe Anne, you could talk about this a little more, this book, Boston Adventure, was a huge success. Um, and sometimes you see writer, contemporary readers go through this exercise of reading sort of the bestsellers of the past and it turns out to be like this awful fruitless exercise. And, you know, we realize how much the modes of what is popular have changed. But I'm curious to know whether you two as readers feel like this book sort of holds up as a popular read, as a bestseller or not. Well, I agree with Catherine. It is so strange as a book that in and it and it feels to me just trying to understand how it could have sold 122,000 copies to the armed services to soldiers is like I I don't see it, but it did. <laughs> um, so it, it's sort of a reminder of how it's hard to project back into why it might have been a bestseller then. And I I was reminded that. Stafford actually was, she was kind of, of course she was happy that it did very well, but she actually felt that her highbrow, you know, new critics, agrarian, partisan review circle friends kind of looked down their noses at her. I mean, this was like a, this was bestseller on a scale that suggested lowbrow, which mm. is so not what this book is. I mean, quite the contrary and I I don't know I hadn't read it in a really long time and I've read it again and I I guess what strikes me as really fascinating about it and I think it still would hold this fascination is that it is you would think it is going to be a portrait of the artist as a young yeah. woman and that's how it's you get the first half of the book and you have this you know amazingly sort of mythic fairy tale infused perspective and then you get the kind of satiric um, social novel of manners perspective but um, all told in a style with a sort of level of sophistication and analytic insight that could only belong to someone who became a writer you know, so you're, and you're, yeah. I found myself super aware of that the whole time I was reading. It's like, wow, wait, yeah. wait, 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 wait. How is this person who is acting like she doesn't really know what she's doing and her greatest goal is to be the secretary of this old spinster who has memoirs she's writing that <laughs> he doesn't want to write. And, and you're sort of, so it's a kind of psychological puzzle of a, fascinating sort you know what is it to occupy an identity as a writer and what are the obstacles and 
is in that room feels like it's about a kind of desire to pull back from this consciousness that we see operating in the book, which is seeing everything and trying to make sense of everything. And then takes into this sort of retreats into this room, which is a kind of anesthetic, peaceful, but hauntingly strange, passive place. And then you think of her trajectory in the book, she never is granted the I am now an artist moment. Yeah. In fact, yeah. quite the contrary. And that's the way it's such a weird anti-Proust novel. But yeah. I guess I think it feels very um, psychologically, as her work does, anachronistic for its own time and anachronistic for our time too, but in yeah. a way that feels abidingly interesting, I, I think. Um, well, it seemed to me that um, I, because you could, you could view it as the portrait of the artist as a young girl, um, I guess, sort of initially. Uh, but, it, but in terms of the psychology that she is um, exploring, and I think this for me had to do with that red room, which by the way, it's, it's sort of hard to explain, but <laughs> she has this vision of this red room that is every bit as precisely described as every other room she enters in the course of the book. And, and most of the places she goes, she either views with scorn, I think, mm -hmm. or envy. I think scorn and envy are driving the psychology of this character, except for this very strange room. And it, it's called, uh, okay, so I wrote this down so I get it right. So it's, um, it's, the, um, and where did I write it? Der Traum der Roten Kammer is the name of a book, The Dream of the Red Chamber. And we encountered this book, Der Traum der Roten Kammer, um, later on, after she's already been in the Red Chamber, it turns out that this book features in a sort of subplot having to do with a romantic triangle. Right. And it's an actual book, but she has not known of the book before no. she has the vision of the book. So there's some way often in the course of the, of the novel that you realize that there's something she is aware of that is preceding her actual experience of the thing itself, which I think also accounts for the very strange, almost surreal feeling of the book as a whole. Um, and I, I think the fact that the thing about children, um, I, I don't think she was interested, I don't think she was at all interested in adults. Um, I mean, Sony gets to be a young adult. That's about as old as she is. Um, I was thinking about the work of her. I haven't reread re -read all the short stories, but in the novels, the adults are all horrible losers, um, <laughs> sort of helpless. They are not making life any better for anybody. And the idea that what you would want would be to achieve adulthood is, um, I think, in a way, monstrous. Yeah. And, and, and they often appear as monsters. Literally, Miss Pride at the end of the book is like a praying mantis. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, so I think that that was what, I think, incipients really interested um, Gene Stafford and Arrival did not. Mm, mm. That's so interesting. And it's, it's, it's like, as Anne suggested, right? You kind of, with that interest in sort of beginning, um, you, and you expect the novel to sort of take the form of this, you know, autobiographical self-portrait and, 
ending with the sort of becoming of the artist. And Catherine, as you just said, like there are moments in the book as with the sort of inversion of the introduction of this book about the Red Room coming after the vision of it, where it seems like there's a consciousness in charge of the novel, but it's unclear who that really is. Like how can Sony know this thing before it's actually happened? I had forgotten actually, I read this book like six months ago and I had completely forgotten about the love triangle at the end, which is like super bizarre. Um, it is a really full, full book. I think this book has its doubters, um, but I really, it's a book I'm just deeply fond of. And I think in some, in some ways, it's one of those things where I had a really pleasant reading experience the first time I read it. And so my affection for it is rooted in this memory of really being lost in it. Um, and you said this thing that's so intriguing about the book being kind of an inverse of James, which I hadn't thought about, but you're quite right. Like it's sort of like, James inverted in this country in, in sort of in every way actually um but I don't but I think it's so readable I found it so I found it so I find it very enjoyable to read as strange as Catherine is saying like there are these moments that are strange and there are these moments of kind of grotesquerie especially with Miss Pride <clears throat> who is this figure who Sony yearns for but reveals herself to be kind of awful by the end of the book um, or actually it's clear from the get-go but by the end Sony kind of understands how awful she is but it's still a book that I just feel like I have such affection for and I feel like it's sort of like it's got such charm to it you know it's so seductive um, we talked briefly the three of us about um, situating Stafford in this kind of ongoing project of um, reclamation, especially of writers who were women from previous generations, whether it's at mid-century or, or not. But I don't think Stafford was ever really obscure necessarily. I mean, she won the Pulitzer Prize many years after this book was published for her collected stories. But I do feel like I, hers is a name I hear now more often. Um, we, I mentioned that there is that Library of America edition. I know New York Review Books has published The Mountain Lion. I don't think The Catherine Meal, which was her last book, is in print anywhere. Um, or is it? Do you know, Anne? I don't think it is. Yeah, I don't think it is. Library of America. Oh, right. It's oh, in well, the right, right, right. It's in, in the novel. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, this isn't really a question, but like where... Do you think Stafford was forgotten? Do you think she's being reclaimed now? And what do you think of this kind of endless cycle of this reclamation of women writers from previous points in this culture? Like, is it a good, is it a bad, is it just a trend? Well, I, I will say maybe this is, you know, when I embarked on the biography, I think my thought was, People are really interested in, you know, Lowell and Berryman and Delmar Schwartz and that whole circle. People are really interested in the partisan review crowd. And, and she had a kind of, she was a rare woman in these very male circles. At the New Yorker, that was less true, but she had a place there and that she was part of the New Yorker crowd and the agrarian crowd, you know, she sort of crossed boundaries in a way that interested me. You know, this is now 20 years ago. And mm -hmm. yet people weren't really talking about, and it struck me that I wanted to know more about what, what was it like for her to be that. And I also was struck by how for the men, the sense of being part of a generation was extremely strong, particularly among the poets and the confessional urge to kind of market out their lives being sort of of historical defining, you know, significance and interconnected. And, and I guess I raise this because what I'm wondering about the reclamation of Stafford and Hardwick and uh, um, Elizabeth Hardwick and Mary yep. McCarthy and you know people haven't totally forgotten them but they have been brought to the fore in a new way is is it in part 
out of a spirit quite different from this generational solidarity spirit that seems to apply to the men. Because I think is what Catherine was saying and you were saying too, Rama, there's something so sui generis about Stafford and she herself in, a, in her literary role really was a non-joiner, even though she also wanted to be sort of part of these circles. And she wrote this weird novel that was unlike any novel anybody was writing, even if she was listening to her agrarian mentors and putting symbols where they belonged. And But she still came up with something that was just... Yeah. And I think Mountain Lion is really pretty unlike any yeah. other novel too. And and her stories, they seem, you first think, oh, these are sort of New Yorker, well wrought, the surface is perfect. And there's this chasm, this darkness, this fractured identity stuff going on in them that feels very, very disorienting in ways that it's hard to find anything to compare her to. So, and I think you, and, and sort of dark and ugly and angry. And I wonder if some of that kind of common uh, thread. And when you think of Elizabeth Hardwick bursting forms in different ways, even than Stafford did that, something of that is a real interest now, kind of mm -hmm. seeing that part of her and some of her contemporaries. It's just, that's sort of my uh, possible way of thinking about it. And they were, um, Jean Stafford, Elizabeth Hardwick, Mary McCarthy, not that any of them wrote like, I mean, they were all very original writers. Yes. Um, they were <laughs> writing, I think, about, um, they were writing very, they were looking deeply into uh, female experience. And you know what? Nobody thought that that was, you know, serious literature. Mm. I mean, it was, uh, it, it was, I mean, not when I say nobody, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but I think the tendency was to think that the experience of these, <clears throat> these men, male experience, fathers and sons, brothers, soldiers, that's serious literature. And if you're writing about a girl who's uh, acting as the secretary to an old spinster in Brahmin, Boston, that's, you know, like Ladies Home Journal or something. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think I, I'm exaggerating a little, but I do think that that certainly back at that time seemed to be much more the prevalent attitude. And one thing I realized reading the book this time, and I got I got sort of completely immersed in it. Um, I think the way I did the first time I read it, but I'm a you know different person now. And I felt in the weirdest way, like I was reading the, um, the autobiography of my mother. Um, mm. Interesting. And, it, and it was so moving to me. Um, although, you know, my mother didn't, go on to be a writer, I, but I think she would have wanted to. I mean, I just felt like this was a picture of something and a very accurate psychological portrait of a woman at a particular moment in the history of this, this world um, mm -hmm. that uh, really, really spoke to me. That's so interesting and you know, I don't, I understand what you're saying when the idea, the notion that um, a novel by a woman, a novel about women's lives is a kind of ladies home journal concern, but Boston Adventure, especially the big, the first half, which is concerned with Sony's childhood is so crazily bleak. Like the descriptions of domestic life are so, insane. I mean, when I was reading the book, I felt really cold and damp. Like it sort of just feels like it's winter in this awful place. And the descriptions of their home, their material privation, the food that they eat, um, her, Sony's mother has another child in the beginning of the book. 
all of that stuff about maternity and then the birth of this sort of magical child who then vanishes, it's like a changeling child who vanishes. It's, it's really like mythic and fairy tale and very, very unsettling and is very, you'd have to be reading in pretty bad faith to dismiss it as like a domestic, you know, it's like clearly so doing so much more than that. Um, actually, one of the questions in our Q&A, and we will take questions, but one of the questions in the Q&A um, notes that, they, that the reader had seen a comparison between this book and Cinderella. Um, and so they're asking for your thoughts on that particular comparison. Well, um, I'll answer fast. And then yeah. <laughs> and you can go. Um, I think, you know, there, there are certain um, plot strategies that novelists use, whether on purpose or not. And I think Cinderella, that story, is a very compelling plot strategy. Like you start out with, you know, the, the benighted soul and the reader is hoping and hoping for the prince and then, and then Cin in Cinderella lo and behold, along comes the prince. And it's sort of like the triumph of the one who you think is the nobody. That's the Cinderella story. I don't, I, I think I could see where that is a kind of, um, I could see that being seen as a pattern in this book, but in fact, in a way it's, it's, um, it, it's it, it, it turns it upside down. Um, it makes you think that's what you're hoping for in a way. It makes you think you're hoping in a weird way for Sony to, you know, end up living in a really nice house in yeah. Boston, <laughs> even though, of course, that would be a terrible, that would be a fate worse than death. So it, 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 uh, it plays with your um, Cinderella wishes, but pulls the Cinderella rug out from under you. Yeah, I would agree that there are two plot strands in it that there are two men who you think at different points possibly are going to be Sony's, not exactly Prince, but, but the person who will rescue her from Miss Pride. But what's very striking about both of them is that you sort of know from the very beginning that that's not gonna happen to, to your point, Catherine. It just feels like that's not where the energy of the novel is and it's really clear, but it, that, the fact that that's the case is, is part of the fascination of how it unfolds. Um, yeah. Um, we also have a question um, that touches on something that Anne mentioned earlier, which is the question of, um, Stafford's other influence. Um, I, I think, and I think I probably just cribbed this from Anne's biography, but um, it's very clear really reading this book that the other great influence in the book beyond James is Proust. Um, but Anne, maybe you wanna talk a little bit about Stafford's relationship to Proust or what it was she was trying to accomplish by braiding sort of James and Proust together artistically. Yeah, I, as she always said, or maybe it was Lowell or somebody said, well, it's not really Proust, it's Moncrief's Proust, because right. <laughs> it is, it's true, the sort of stylistic yeah. ornateness and everything. Um, I, I guess I think it, the Proust part is the way in which she is playing with a portrait of an artist in a, as in tension with immersion in society and, but having the end be the anti-Proustian end. It's, I will end up siding with society even if this decadent social world is an entrapment. Um, and I think there just are passages in it where she does a kind of analyzing of her interior state is less of the mythic and less of the Jamesian crystalline stuff that feels very Proustian too. And 
I think that, um, you know, she, I, I, I guess I really do feel like she wanted and quite self-consciously wanted the end to feel like I'm pulling that rug out from under you too. Um, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. The And I do think that this book has a, a sort of sh almost a shocking end because as you say, the book kind of faints around and you can tell it's not going to have a kind of Prince Charming ending, but then you're sort of like, well, how is it going to end? And the way that it ends is sort of, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky, it is a slippery book. Um, one of the, there's an interesting question and I, I don't know if either of you will have any perspective on this um, about writers in turn who have been influenced by Stafford or if you're conscious of anyone who is talking about Stafford as a touchstone for them working today. I, yeah, I felt I read something you said, Catherine, once. Yeah, she was an influence for me. Um, I don't know if, I do not know if somebody reading what I'm writing right now would think, oh, this is just like Boston Adventure. But I feel like I learned from her that the, the strangeness of life could be um, replicated with all of the sort of devices of realism. And you could have the two things happening simultaneously and that it was very exciting the way she did that. Plus, she is very funny. Um, <laughs> we have left that out. We yes, we that. have. It yes. It makes it yes. sound like, you know, yeah. you read this and it's like so grim and terrible, but I just, and I just wrote down a couple things. Um, these, I mean, these are just like stupid examples, but at one point a character says, I love the mountains. They don't smell of clams. <laughs> <laughs> People say, you know, things like that. Um, she refers to a character, an unliked character, and this is all from the point of view of Sony, it's all first person, as an enemy to music and to mankind. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I, I actually went through it at one point, sort of just taking what Sony overhears, because she's sort of like a spy, you know, she's yeah. in these different rooms and she, and she just <laughs> comes up with these amazing lines that people have. Do you remember the one where she's listening to what uh, the, the, her friend, Betty Bronson, this is in the opening section where she's hired to be a housekeeper in the house of a friend of hers, which is awkward enough. And that friend's mother's having a baby. So is Sony's mother having a baby. That friend has no idea about how babies are born. And there's a line goes, Maudie, when you got your boys, did they come right off the cake of ice or were they down on the shelves underneath? <laughs> and that just felt to me like she always gets this, I don't know, just a sort of twist of a line, <laughs> just really funny. Um, and, and plays Sony's cluelessness sometimes for humor, even when it's really bleak. There is a wickedness in some of that observation and some of the sort of social comedy that happens in the latter half of the book that is just so, so funny. And it's so, you know, it's got this sort of drawing room comedy quality to it. And I do really love all of that stuff. In, in reading it again, this six months ago or whenever it was that I read it, I was also conscious maybe more so than in previous readings of some of the creakiness, um, some of the stuff around character names, like some of the character names seem a little leaden to me. Um, her, you know, her, um, her employer who is her salvation, her last name is Pride. Um, her employer's niece is named Hope Still, which is a, sort of an extraordinary name. Um, there's all this, there's this kind of business with a trapped cat. Her, her employer, Miss Pride, has a cat who no one ever sees and is described living its life inside of a closet. And like, 
some of that stuff felt a little like wooden to me, but I also still kind of loved it. Um, it's a strange thing to 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 see. You could kind of see the seams, but I sort of loved all of that stuff, even the heavy handedness of the names. And I couldn't help feeling because there are just also plot things that I made, you know, um, being thrown from horses, things like that, yes. which are just yeah. completely you know, staples that you have the feeling. I mean, Stafford, I think young writer though she was, I think she knew what she was doing. She sort of meant them to be overdone mm -hmm. pictures. I think whether that works all the time or not seems to be another question, but I, I, I read it certainly as her quite in control of her sort of heavy handedness, but mm -hmm. maybe that's wrong. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. The names to me read, um, because, okay, so the very first sentence of the book is, because we were very poor and could not buy another bed, I used to sleep on a pallet made of old coats and comforters in the same room with my mother and father. And that is very much to me like the opening of a kind of, fairy tale. And I feel like, although this is certainly not written in the style of a fairy tale, it doesn't have the flat character quality of fairy tales, but that the names of characters were very much in keeping with this sort of sense of the world being um, like a tale. And you are in this tale and you are, um, you are in thrall to what goes on, um, no matter how hard you try to, you know, be exercising your own will. And um, I felt like the names were working that way for me. So that I was, I was sort of, I was sort of liking them. Um, uh, I, I had, I had very few, um, you know, I, I mean, I don't think the book is perfect, but yeah. so what book is, and in yeah. a way this book was, um, I think much more pleasing to me this time around reading it than it was when I first read it. And, um, and I was sort of, uh, I was astonished by what this woman who, she had to have been 27 when she was writing it, if it came out when she was 29, um, yeah. I mean, at least 27. Uh, it's it's kind of um, uh, jaw dropping. Yeah. And having you know seen the manuscripts of the three novels she wrote and submitted that were rejected, it's even more amazing because she was so far from anything like this. Um, and can you remind me? You it's mentioned in your biography the title of the previous novel that she had been working on. Um, it has like the funniest title. Well, I, th I I may have the order wrong. One of them was Witch No Vicissitude, which I think is yes. probably what you're thinking <laughs> of. I think that might've been two back, but yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, yeah. And how, how did you feel about the unpublished work? Did you feel that there was, um, merit in them beyond for the scholar or do you think that they are best left in her papers? Oh, no, no question. They should be left uh, uh, in her papers. And I, mm. I'm sure she thought so too in the end. Mm. You know, I mean, I yeah, they, they were not, um, they were truly didn't work. Um, mm -hmm. and, and she, you know, spent the last, I mean, I guess this is, one thing we haven't really talked about, you know, she she did have a very, a lot, well, not that many decades, but quite a few decades in which she really could not, though she was working on another novel, make headway on it. And it was a novel that was still quite related to the three manuscripts that she'd started at the beginning. So it's sort of interesting to see a writer who can't quite let go of something, but also mm -hmm. can't make it happen. And it was more autobiographical. And I think she just more directly autobiographical. I think her writing, 
each of these novels one can see in autobiographical terms, but she was trying for something more confessionally raw and mm -hmm. couldn't, couldn't do it, which, I mean, when you look at what she can do, it seems yeah. so she can do that. That's no, you know, she could do something so different so well. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sad, there's a sadness there because she didn't, she didn't write for so very long then after the three novels and, you know, she did, she did write stories. It's not a huge, it's not a huge body of work from a writer who was really, as we seem to all agree, is sort of unusual, is sort of sui generis, is sort of has her own kind of thing. And um, I feel a sadness about it, I do, but, um, but I also think Boston Adventure is a really sort of, it's a very unusual book and it's a really like, it's gratifying to me to know that it's back in the world in this edition and that people can encounter it because I still found it like, I mean, and I heard Catherine say this too on rereading it, that it can kind of sweep you up even if you've read it before, even if you know what's happening, if you understand what the tricks are, it's still kind of, is a powerful, like you're kind of in the thrall, like as you said, Catherine, like you accepted the sort of outlandish character names. The character names are sort of laden with symbolism because you're in the hands of the writer who is telling, who's sort of telling you a story. And I love that particular feeling, you know? No, I agree. And I guess one thing I, I wonder if this, I was struck again and maybe it, how much it's about, it's sort of mythic, yeah. the register in some way, that's how she can get away with things that you don't think she would otherwise get away with, is that she's got some unusual register all along that kind of allows things to get in that don't seem like they would find a place, but then they do. And I felt as though, and maybe this is again, sort of biographical overreading, she was working on this a lot while Lowell was converting to Catholicism and she was sort of part of that whole really intensive um, moment in his life and herself interested. And I think that the red room image, it comes up in another story, her interior castle story. And it is, she's using St. Teresa and there is something about a kind of spiritual journey I think mm -hmm. in this too, you know, that mm -hmm. that's one way I found that I could kind of make sense of things that otherwise didn't quite make sense. And, and, mm -hmm. and it's not ju just trying to make sense of it, but compelling sense. Um, mm -hmm. that yeah, that's so, yeah. A there's lot. a lot, there's, there's a lot there. There's a lot there to try and figure out, but, and, and again, it's sort of striking. I'm glad that Catherine reminded us of this, that she was, 27 probably when she was writing that it's sort of extraordinary you know and you know another aspect of the book we haven't mentioned um so it's this first person narrative it's sony telling us her story and and we do not know there is no indication <clears throat> this sort of standard question you'd ask somebody writing something like this where the first person narrator is narrating the story of events in the past in their life and there's always mm -hmm. the question what calls forth this telling of this story or from what point in the present life yeah. of this narrator is this story being told and i think one of the things that's pretty amazing about the book is that you don't, uh, uh, at least I did not find myself um, preoccupied with that question. It was as if we were, we were born on some wave of, of telling and mm. there was no reason to wonder about that. There's a kind of um, confidence in the telling that just carries you right along. Like you're on, a, you're, like on a tidal wave, sort of, because you get the feeling that the whole thing's kind of going to come crashing down, but um, but we're not told that. 
And that's amazing. And it is amazing. And that takes me back to what I was sort of tiptoeing around again uh, uh, earlier about the end of the book, which is that, as you're saying, Catherine, you kind of expect the end to say, like, here is where I am situated now, and this is why I'm telling you this story. But in fact, the way the book concludes, it's as though, like, it's happening in the moment. Like, the, the recall of all of these events has been leading right up to the conclusion of the book, and then you're right there with her. It's a very, it's a strange, it's a strange shift. Um, it's 8.30 already. Um, I hope that we did a compelling job of selling this book to you. Um, it was so much fun to talk to Catherine and Anne. Thank you so much for talking to me about the Boston Venture tonight. Thank well, you. This was really fun to talk to, to both of you. And, um, but we didn't answer anybody's questions. We did. I wove, I, I tricked you into answering them before. I wove them into our conversation. Oh, oh. <laughs> Remind, you're an excellent moderator for you. Hold on, I'll seamlessly. Um, thank you, all three of you, so, so much for this conversation. It was really outstanding. I had a great time. Um, and to the audience, for your very thoughtful questions. Um, and for those of you at home, please do get a copy of Boston Adventure if you can. And we hope that you'll join us for another virtual event at Community Bookstore soon. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night.